Okay, let me get started. Well, good morning. I'd like to call the Subcommittee on Digital Commerce and Consumer Protection to order. And the Chair now recognizes himself for five minutes for an opening statement. And again, good morning to our witnesses and welcome to this legislative hearing on the Internet of Things. Today we will discuss the bipartisan state of modern application research and trends of IoT Act or the SMART Act IoT discussion draft. The SMART IoT Act discussion draft is a result of work that the Digital Commerce and Consumer Protection Subcommittee has done over the past two years. Last July, this subcommittee held an Internet of Things showcase. At that event, members invited companies from our districts and across America to demonstrate products and services in the IoT field. It was a wonderful opportunity to see this revolutionary work up close and interact with the inventors doing this important work. To accompany that showcase, we held a hearing where participants from the showcase discussed their companies, challenges they face with growing in the space and what we as policy makers can do to help promote the continued development of the IoT solutions. This January, we held a hearing on the state of manufacturing in the IoT space. And over the following months, we met with other builders, suppliers, customers, and experts to better understand IoT's enormous potential. This technology is having a real Im life impact for many of our constituents. I personally met with manufacturers in my district that are using this cutting edge technology to maintain their machinery and, and keep production on track. I also met with farmers in Defiance, Ohio, who are using IoT for better grain management, increased planting and harvesting efficiency, and improved monitoring of the temperature in their storage facilities. The draft legislation we discussed today is the result of important bipartisan work after hearing from the experts where we notice one lingering question. What does the universe of rules, regulations, guidelines, and best practices look like for the IoT space? While we know there are many other topics of interest in this space, this legislation kicks off a process to give all stakeholders a base set of information to frame the other challenges without speculating or hypothesizing about what already exists. The IoT is already revolutionizing the way that we organize factories and supply chains to transport commodities like oil and gas, make manufacturing more efficient, maximize energy efficiency, and even restock our refrigerators. This subcommittee has engaged in historic bipartisan work with the Self-Drive Act this Congress, and I'm pleased to see that cooperation continue with the smart IoT. When safely applied to autonomous vehicles, the Internet of Things holds the potential to significantly reduce traffic fatalities and make our roads safer while reducing costs through more efficient fuel consumption. <clears throat> In these areas and more, the IoT holds the potential to greatly improve the lives of Americans. I want to thank my colleague, Representative Welsh, for his willingness to continue our work together on this very important issue. As many here know, in previous Congresses, Representative Welsh and I started the Internet of Things Working Group. We heard from industry and other stakeholders about the importance of light touch regulation to foster innovation and jobs here in the United States. The bipartisan draft is a result of the lessons learned in those meetings, this subcommittee's disruptor series hearings, and the, the, lays the groundwork for constructive conversations in the future. The Smart IoT Act will give all stakeholders, both private and industry, and at the federal level, a better sense of what guidelines and best practices exist or in development. As we all know, IoT issues cut across so many industries and so many federal agencies. Ensuring that we know about overlaps or potential duplication is important for many reasons from ensuring efficient use of government resources to understanding how stakeholders are addressing some of the important but challenging issues of privacy and data security. From the Department of Commerce's efforts to foster the advancement of the IoT ecosystem to the development to the Department of Transportation's focus on advancing automated vehicle, so much work is being done in this space. We want to encourage our interagency collaboration and foster an environment where transportation, or, pardon me, <coughs> where transparency is key. Likewise, I'd like to ensure that the environment for innovation in the United States across all of these industries remains a priority by optimizing our own efforts to promote good, consistent government. I believe the Smart IoT Act is an important step in doing just that. And again, one of the things I always like to say is that one of the great things about serving on the Energy and Commerce Committee is that we kind of look over the horizon five to ten years. 
when we hear from our witnesses, we want to hear from you to know exactly where you're going to be because we don't want to have our regulators or our laws that we're thinking about enacting looking in a rear view mirror or at the end of a car, but we need to be looking far out into the future. So again, I want to thank our witnesses for being with us today, and I look forward to your testimony today. And with that, I recognize the general lady from Illinois, the ranking member of the subcommittee, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this subcommittee frequently discusses the Internet of Things. We've had hearings on IoT and manufacturing and wear wearable devices, not to mention our IoT showcase last summer. Today, we transition from general discussion to discussion of actual legislation. The Smart IoT Act is a first step. It would require the Commerce Department to survey the use of connected devices and examine the federal role in this space. As the bill acknowledges, Internet connected devices provide an opportunity for economic growth, but we want to ensure that those devices are developed securely. My hope is that the report genera generated by the Smart IoT Act provides the foundation for further legislative efforts. Our, hearing on the Internet, our hearings on the Internet of Things have raised important issues. What privacy and cybersecurity protections are going to be um, baked into these devices? Normal households, uh, household items can now collect very personal data that must be stored and used appropriately. Connected devices present new safety concerns. The Consumer Product Safety Commission just held a public hearing on IoT and safety last week with stakeholders on that very subject. We need the infrastructure to support the rise of connected devices, including affordable broadband. The Internet of Things could also disrupt the current labor market. We must ensure workers are prepared for a changing economy. Finally, we must make the strategic investments in research to promote future innovation. Last week's hearing on quantum computing made clear that the United States is not providing the consistent support necessary to keep groundbreaking research moving forward. Standing on the sidelines is simply not an option. These are big issues for Congress to tackle, and we must rise to the challenge. We know what happens if we rely on industry self-regulation. Consumer privacy goes unprotected and safety is put at risk. The Smart IoT Act should provide a resource for us to better understand the variety of devices on the market. I plan to use this information as I continue my push for comprehensive consumer privacy and data security legislation. We have had bipartisan furor uh, fear over mis, uh, misuses of consumer data. It's time now for bipartisan solutions to the problem. The bill before us is a natural extension of the work that members of the subcommittee have been doing for the last couple of sessions. In 2016, Congressman Latta, Latta and Welch convened stakeholders for several forums under their IoT working group to discuss this, uh, the Internet the Internet of Things and the issues new, uh, that new technology raise. In many ways, the study in the SMART IoT Act is a formalization of that very survey. In the coming weeks, I look forward to working on a bipartisan basis to move this legislation forward. And then I'm ready to take the next step of updating consumer protections and funding key investments. The Internet of Things has tremendous potential. We must work together to make sure that America benefits from that opportunity. I thank you, Chairman Latta. I yield back unless anybody wants the remaining time. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, the chairman of the full committee for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and other members on the committee and to our panels, uh, pa witnesses on the panel, thank you for being here. Uh, today we'll hear testimony about the draft bill, Smart IoT Act, to support the development of Internet of Things here in the U.S. This uh, bipartisan effort underscores one of the key goals of the Energy and Commerce Committee, and that is helping American entrepreneurs establish businesses, expand to create jobs for American workers, and help improve the lives of American consumers. So I'd like to thank Chairman Latta and Representative Welch for working on this issue and finding a bipartisan path forward. This is what we do at the Energy and Commerce Committee, particularly on this subcommittee when faced with new technology policy questions. We've done that on the Self-Drive Act. I would commend my 
colleagues on both sides of the aisle for the good work there. Now we just need to get the Senate <coughs> to move forward, um, <laughs> as we are wont to do in many cases. The Internet of Things, or IoT, does hold great promise to connect workers, suppliers, products, consumers throughout efficient networks that can save time, money, and, uh, and bring about new innovation and resources. Building this network won't be easy. We know that. It requires engineers, uh, entrepreneurs, and visionaries. It also requires public policies that foresee a world designed for the next century policies that are forward-looking and that reflect a world to come, self-driving cars, self-organizing materials, and innovations we've yet to even think of. These must uh, replace many of our still existing rules and policies that reflect the old technologies of the last century. While America has changed, many of our regulations, unfortunately, have not. That is one of the purposes of this legislation that's before us today. It's meant to set the stage by making sure stakeholders are aware of the playing field and are not creating conflicting or duplicative obligations or requirements. So the SMART IoT Act will create the first compendium of essentially who is doing what in the IoT space. This includes the efforts undertaken by private industry as well as a review of what agencies are doing. Removing regulatory barriers to innovation is one of the most important duties of this committee. Doing so allows our economy to grow, our workers to flourish, and innovation to, to occur here in the United States. The best way to start is to know what is out there already or being developed today. It's important to note that since January of 2017, more than 3 million new jobs have been created in America. The U.S. unemployment rate now at 3.9 percent is the lowest seen in this country since the year 2000. And what's more, this comes as more Americans rejoin the workforce, millions once again finding work after years of hardship. So creating jobs and opportunity is a goal shared by all of us on this committee, a fact reflected in the bipartisan work on the Smart IoT Act. Chairman Latta and Representative Welch have been working on these issues for several years now. Glad to see that this progress uh, has been made, and we have a great opportunity uh, going forward to do even more. So, Mr. Chairman and members of both sides of the aisle, thanks for your good work on this. We have a couple of hearings going on simultaneously, as I'm sure our witnesses and members know, so some of us will be popping back and forth, but we value your testimony, which we have here, and the good bipartisan work. And with that, I yield back the remaining balance of my time. Well, thank you very much. The gentleman yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, the ranking member of the full committee for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today's hearing on the draft uh, Smart Internet of Things Act is the next step in the subcommittee's review of new and evolving technological development, and I commend Chairman Lada and Representative Welch for working together over the last several years to explore and learn how the Internet of Things, or IoT, can enrich our lives, help us be more efficient, and grow the U.S. economy. Today, more and more people have multiple Internet-connected devices in their homes, things like thermostats, vacuums, and digital personal assistants, and more and more people are wearing Internet-connected devices, such as fitness trackers. But IoT is not limited to consumer products. Connected devices of all kinds are used in practically every industry sector, like manufacturing, agriculture, and medicine. We've learned about drones that fly into dangerous areas to assess hazards, sensors helping farmers understand the topography and acidity of their land, and doctors receiving real-time data from monitors so that patients in remote areas do not have to travel for daily appointments. And today we're considering a bipartisan draft bill that would direct the Department of Commerce to conduct a comprehensive study and report on the Internet of Things. Commerce will survey the industry sectors that make Internet-connected devices as well as all industry sectors that use those devices. The study will also look at how the federal government oversees the use and development of connected devices, which agencies deal with the Internet of Things, what expertise those agencies have, and what entities those agencies interact with. And the study will identify government resources available to consumers and small businesses to help them evaluate connected devices. The report will provide a one-stop source on how businesses are integrating connectivity and how the federal government is helping the country adapt to this age of connectivity. Federal and local government agencies could also use the report to better coordinate their work, and I hope the study will encourage them to do so. And any report will be a snapshot in time, but given the integration of IoT into all parts of our lives in the global economy, the report will provide a jumping off point for more work. I would certainly like to see a cybersecurity issues given more emphasis when we look at IoT. Throughout our review, cybersecurity was the issue that came up most often. Cybersecurity is imperative to keeping ourselves and our country safe from 
malicious actors. And I know some stakeholders have asked that cybersecurity be specifically called out in the study. I would support such a change, but whether it's made part of the study required by this bill or not, Congress must take, act, take action to ensure that strong cybersecurity and data security are fundamental to IoT. So I'm glad that this subcommittee is working on this bipartisan legislation, and I'd like to yield the balance of my time to the sponsor, Congressman Welch. Uh, thank you very much, and I want to thank uh, Chairman Latta uh, and Ranking Member Schakowsky for this hearing. Uh, it was great to work with uh, Mr. Latta, too, and the uh, Inter IoT Working Group, 21 members. Uh, that had hearings in advance. We're trying to uh, get educated before we pass legislation, which isn't necessarily how we usually operate. Uh, but this is a huge opportunity with the Internet of Things. You know, McKenzie and Company uh, did a study and says that it can be between four and eleven trillion dollars uh, annually by 2025. So that's really quite extraordinary. My colleagues have. Uh, already uh, spoken about what many of these opportunities are and also Ranking Member Schakowsky, I think pointing out some of the implications that we have to contend with with labor is really, really important for all of us to keep in mind. But I'll just give one example in Vermont. There's brutal pressure on our dairy farmers now. The price is down, uh, the costs are up, and technology is helping some of those farmers hang on. And uh, Mangan Brothers uh, Dairy Farm in East Fairfield, Vermont, has a computerized internet-based milking system uh, that's really been helpful to them. They installed a milking uh, parlor about two decades ago, uh, and now what happens when the cow comes in, they have a pedometer on their, uh, on their leg, and as soon as the cow cr uh, crosses the threshold of the milking parlor, the sensor picks up which cow it is and relays the information to the computer. And all the statistics about the cow's movements and body temperature and other pertinent information is sent to the computer. And uh, it's even relevant for when in, uh, the breedings are done just based on activity spikes. Uh, it also gives them a report at the end of every milking day uh, with, with respect to the salt content. And that's an indicator that allows the farmers to uh, take steps to avoid diseases. So it's a big deal in terms of productivity for them, and it is made possible uh, by uh, the Internet of Things. And just the last point in my last few seconds, the only way we're going to have the Internet of Things in rural America is to have broadband in rural America, and that's another enormous challenge we have, and it's woefully underserved. So we can talk all we want about the Internet of Things, but unless we have broadband, uh, it's not going to happen. So I uh, yield back and thank uh, my colleagues for uh, the time. The gentleman yields back, and I just want to say just briefly, I, I really appreciate all the work that you and I have done on IoT and also uh, not only chairing the working group, but also working together chairing the rural broadband. So I appreciate all you've been doing, and uh, thank you very much. That now concludes members' opening statements, and the chair now reminds members that pursuant to the committee rules, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record. And again, I want to thank all of our witnesses for being with us today. We greatly appreciate you taking the time to testify before the subcommittee. Today's witnesses will have the opportunity to give five-minute opening statements, followed by a round of questions from our members. Our witness panel for today's hearing will include Mr. Tim Day, the Senior Vice President of the Chamber Technology Engagement Center at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Ms. Michelle Richardson, Deputy Director of the Freedom, Security, and Technology Project of the Center for Democracy and Technology, and Ms. Dipti Vashani, Vice President of the Internet of Things Group and General Manager of the Strategy and Solutions e Engineering Division at Intel. And again, I want to thank you all for being here again. And Mr. Day, you are recognized for five minutes. If you just pull that mic up close and turn the mic on, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chairman Lada, Ranking Member Schakowsky, and distinguished members of the House Subcommittee of Digital Commerce and Consumer Protection. Thank you for the opportunity today to testify about the Internet of Things. I'm Tim Day, Senior Vice President of the Chamber's Technology Engagement Center, or CTEC. The Chamber established CTEC three years ago to tell the story of how technology can empower all Americans. At CTEC, we have focused our work on autonomous vehicles, unmanned aircraft, telecommunications, and the new economy. All of these issues and technologies are connected and supported by the Internet of Things. Everyone participating in this hearing today is in one way or another 
one of the nearly 11 billion internet connected devices projected by Gartner to be in use today worldwide. Whether we are streaming this hearing on a smartphone, whether or not we've asked uh, Amazon Alexa or Google, Google Home directions to the Rayburn House office building, or a wearable counted the number of steps it took to get here, we all have been connected and our lives are being improved by the Internet of Things. Not only does IoT technology directly benefit consumers, it is also making businesses smarter and more efficient. For example, the agricultural sector for better crop yields, healthcare for improved patient outcomes, and manufacturing for improved operations and maintenance. One study has shown that industrial manufacturing IoT spending is predicted to increase to $890 billion worldwide by 2020. And of course, government also stands to benefit from IoT by creating efficiencies in public services, by finding new value for citizens, enhancing capabilities, and streamlining processes. IoT may provide a much needed answer for agencies seeking to meet increasing citizen needs with decreasing budgets. And Chairman Lada, back home in the Buckeye State, Columbus, which was awarded the DOT's 2016 Smart Cities Challenge Grant, is using IoT in research and development to create smart vehicle technologies. Another study has shown that wireless providers will invest $275 billion toward building 5G networks, which will be part of the connectivity backbone of smart cities and IoT. This investment will add $500 billion in GDP and 3 million jobs to the American economy. This number pales in comparison to the $11 trillion worldwide economic impact that is predicted by 2025 for IoT. Needless to say, IoT is an economic game changer. The cham Chamber's president and CEO, Tom Donahue, has stated that technology must be embraced as the growth driver and game changer that it is. That is why it is so critical that the United States maintain leadership in IoT by adopting the right regulatory framework. I would like to suggest a couple of ideas for your consideration to strike the correct regulatory balance. Congress and agencies should do more to reduce the regulatory burdens, compliance costs, and overlap. Government should evaluate existing regulatory activities and bring together stakeholders in government and industry to shape IoT policy. Legislation like the Digit Act and the draft legislation today, the Smart IoT Act, are much needed steps in the right direction to achieve this goal. Additionally, actions like those done by the FCC, led by Commissioner Carr, to streamline communications citing rules are also to be praised. As IoT is still in its infancy, policymakers should avoid the temptation to impose prescriptive regulations on IoT and single out IoT for regulation for issues such as privacy. Congress should continue a policy of technology neutrality. And finally, a skilled workforce will also be critical to the development of this new technology and investment in human capital will determine which countries lead in the way in the uh, going forward in this space. We are currently witnessing a new industrial revolution led by advanced technology, including IoT, which is a force for good that should be fostered by smart regulatory frameworks that encourage investment, promote innovation, as well as connect and empower all Americans. Thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. And Ms. Richardson, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Lada, Ranking Member Schakowsky, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the Center for Democracy and Technology. CDT is a nonprofit technology policy organization dedicated to protecting civil liberties and human rights in the digital world, including privacy, free speech, and access to information. We believe the Internet of Things has the power to enrich people's lives in ways both big and small, but we also recognize that the Internet of Things poses unique privacy and security challenges. Many of these devices collect information that is intensely personal, yet ungoverned by U.S. policy and privacy law. 
it has also become common to hear of serious security breaches which have allowed hackers to use IoT devices to either steal information or participate as part of a botnet. CDT's preference for technology policy is for private industry to voluntarily create and adopt standards. But government plays an important role in setting standards and incentivizing good behavior, especially in sectors where security failures have extreme consequences or in the consumer market when users don't have a fair shot at understanding or managing products. Congress has the authority and the responsibility to determine whether the current government and private balance is the right one. We hope this bill will help collect information to assess that in two ways. First, we hope the Smart IoT Act will collect information to determine whether voluntary standards and privacy standards are not only being created, but whether they are being adopted by a critical mass of industry players. Voluntary standards are the default in the IoT space and billions of devices are up and operating on the internet and more are coming. The foundational question we should be asking is whether this approach is working as a general matter. Second, the study should tease out any overlap or gaps in government oversight of these IoT devices. Cross-agency coordination is crucial to sharing information and will help make sure that the government is not issuing conflicting guidance or requirements. Now, we recommend the bill clearly state that nothing in it should be interpreted to discourage agencies from continuing work in critical areas like connected cars or health devices. Agencies like the FDA and NHTSA are driving standards for devices or systems that have literal life or death consequences, and that work cannot wait. While industry deserves an overarching government plan for IoT, IoT is already too large and too diverse to cabin in a single agency, and developing sector-specific expertise will ensure that government involvement is supported by the technical and policy knowledge needed to make the right decisions. After you receive this report, we expect that you will find that one of the largest gaps in standards and oversight is in the consumer market. As Ms. Vanchani mentions in the IoT report for Intel, most IoT devices and applications relate to industrial products, smart cities, and health, and the health industry. Many of these devices are subject to practical and regulatory limits already. For example, some of these devices are embedded in critical infrastructure, which is already regulated writ large. And some of these devices are really quite simple and do not collect personal information or offer computing power that makes them attractive hacking targets. Think of sensors that only measure water pressure or count the number of cars that pass through an intersection. The users of these sorts of devices also are often more sophisticated, and the corporate versus corporate relationship can contractually ensure that IoT devices continue to work safely. But the consumer ecosystem does not have many of these checks and balances. Consumers are stuck in a take it or leave it system and they will not have the option to leave it much longer as connectivity is built into everything. Lay users just do not have the technical capacity to understand and control the current crop of IoT devices on the market. They also have few legal remedies when something does go wrong. If security fails, devices can be a gateway to stealing personal information or subject the owner to actual spying. Failures can harm a person or her property in the world world like smart locks that can remotely open front doors. And these devices can be taken over as part of a botnet that can send scam email or in the case of the Mirai botnet, take down websites and internet access more generally. In other words, there's a lot at stake in the consumer market and the, cons and the current system is just not working. We're hoping that this committee finds the report to be just the jumping off point for better oversight of consumer products. And we look forward to working with you and your staff on this bill. Well, thank you very much uh, for your testimony. And Ms. Vashani, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Shikowsky, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Intel Corporation. And I commend you and the Congressman Welsh for your leadership on the Smart IoT Act. First, I'd like to turn to the vast benefits of the IoT and discuss real-life IoT use cases that are relevant to the committee's jurisdiction. Gartner predicts that IoT technology will be in 95% of electronics for new product design by 2020. The transformational societal and economic benefits that will flow from this broad deployment of IoT technology is what energizes Intel. And the Smart IoT Act is a welcome indication that this enthusiasm is matched by this subcommittee. 
the IoT is already transforming sectors like healthcare, smart cities, and transportation. I'd like to go over a few use cases. Smart healthcare. Less than 0.01% of patient data is ab available beyond the bedside for healthcare teams to make clinical decisions. To solve this problem, Medical Inf Infotonics, Intel, and Dell partnered on an FDA-cleared IoT platform called SickBay. SickBay continuously captures patient data from a bedside medical devices and transforms it into actional, actionable intelligence. This enables care teams to make better and faster decisions and predict patient deterioration before it occurs. In the last four and a half years, Texas Children's Met Hospital uses SickBay to improve health care for 2.1 million patients. Smart cities. 92% of the world's population lacks access to clean air and leading to millions of deaths annually. To address this, Intel and Bosch develop IoT-powered pollution monitoring systems that provide intelligent data and enable real-time analysis. These IoT systems are used by governments to improve air quality in congested cities like Pune, India, by factory owners to track emissions and provide safety checks for our workers, by construction site managers to provide air quality warnings and improve efficiency, and by cities to provide res residents with recommended times for exercising outdoors. Use case number three, transportation. As the subcommittee is aware, the impact of autonomous vehicles will be life-changing, particularly in their disabled community and aging population. The number of U.S. residents aged 78 and older will in increase by 53.7 million by 2030, compared to just 30.9 million in 2014. Many of these residents live in communities with poor or no public transportation. AVs will offer vastly improved mobility benefits. Intel applauds the committee's leadership on AVs. Next, I'd like to offer st Intel's strong support for the Smart IoT Act and respectfully offer recommendations to enhance the legislation. Nations are racing to lead in this competitive IoT sector. It, is, it has been Intel's strong desire that the federal government be more proactive in ensuring U.S. IoT leadership in declaring the U.S. the IoT a national priority for the innovation and investment <coughs> and competitiveness. We applaud the subcommittee for its bipartisan work to set America on its leadership path by ensuring an IoT study and recommending recommendations to pro promote IoT adoptions to grow our economy. I was on the Hill last October to unveil a broadly supported industry report on IoT. Intel recommendations to the IoT Smart IoT reflect this report. First, we urge the subcommittee to include a robust definition of IoT that is non-proprietary, neutral regarding technologies and applications, and contemplates both the consumer and the industrial IoT. In fact, industrial, smart city, and connected health will make up 70% of the use cases. Second, we urge IoT to you to seek specific recommendations that would be highly impactful on laying the groundwork for the national IoT strategy. This includes recommendations on incentives for the federal government and agencies to adopt IoT technologies to advance their federal mission, including smart infrastructure solutions, how the federal government can best support global industry-led I IoT standard efforts and avoid new regulations that duplicate existing industry standards, and a criteria for the go federal government to invest in IoT public-private par partnerships and test beds. Thank you for the opportunity to share Intel's thoughts on the Smart IoT Act. We look forward to working with you to see this bipartisan bill enacted into law at first step towards a national IoT strategy and ensure U.S. leadership in this transformational sector. Well, again, I want to thank our witnesses for being with us today. We really appreciate your testimony, and that will conclude our uh, testimony from our witnesses, and we'll begin our questioning from our members, and I will recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Day, do you believe a compendium of all current federal action on IoT-related issues will help promote interagency collaboration and result in consistent federal action? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and again, I think what we've heard is that the Internet of Things holds incredible promise um, for our economy and the quality of life for citizens. I do. I, I, I think the, the draft that we have before us today 
helps uh, with increased transparency and in, in how government regulates um, this technology in a better way. Um, we are firm believers that the government should make data available and compi compli complying a list of, of federal policies that affect IoT, I believe, would go a long way in enabling uh, the companies that we're working with at the chamber and others, um, and especially also small and startup companies to understand the regulatory environment that we're faced with today. Uh, yeah, let me ask you about that right there, because I know that uh, when uh, uh, my friend from Vermont and I were doing our working group meetings, and we actually we had them right here in this uh, room, it didn't make any difference if you're from the East Coast, the West Coast, the Midwest, what, what type you're in, as Ms. Vashani was talking about, from everything from healthcare to manufacturing to fintech, you name it. There's one thing that we heard from everyone, that we need to make sure that we have a soft touch regulation out there so people can be out there innovating. And it's nobody, we didn't hear anybody ever say that they were against regulations, but not to have anything that was overburdensome that they couldn't go out and regulate. When you're talking about these smaller companies out there, could you talk to me or talk to the committee a little bit about what you've heard from them, some of the maybe the hurdles that they're facing right now or things that need to be overcome? Absolutely. And, you know, I think what's exciting about this is that um, this does impact <coughs> middle America, the coast, everyone, as you said, is, is impacted by this. And I think when you're a small business and a startup, um, and my focus at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in the emerging technology space it is just that, it's emerging, it's changing by the day, we're still learning what the technology means, and so I think there needs to be a structure but not too prescriptive in the approach. And, you know, quite frankly, business leaders and, and new startups and entrepreneurs are looking to run the, their uh, businesses with um, the support of the government but not being told exactly how to do it because we're still working on the benefits and how this actually applies to you know, the, the companies that we're, we're working with. And so I think what business leaders want to know is, is give me the ability to um, invest, to be able to take my idea to the next step, but don't, you know, regulate me so much that I'm not able to produce quality results and in the end be successful as a, as a startup. Thank you. Mr. Shani, uh, again, I would like to turn to, um, a question to you now. What are some of the IoT applications that Intel is focused on and can you explain how those applications benefit the economy and jobs. And again, I was very interested because I know when you were going through the, uh, the health care, the manufacturing, uh, the transportation, and uh, construction, but if you could get a little more in depth on that, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. So we have, um, gosh, we have over 500 uh, market-ready solutions that we work with the industry to create because one of the things, the common misconceptions about IoT, it's, it's vertical, right? You have a retail solution or you have an industrial solution. And honestly, when you look across the board, our customers are looking at solutions that go across multiple industries. And so they're multi-industry solutions. They don't necessarily sit in one nice little box of a vertical. Um, and so you'll see an industrial environment where they're, where they're trying to do predictive maintenance at the same time as inventory management, at the same time as building management. And you see several different vertical-like solutions coming together into one application. Um, and we believe that the, the maximum benefit is when these solutions start to, to come together. And one of the areas that I want uh, to reflect on is that the U.S. is actually um, a, a, a leader worldwide in our innovation that we have in it, IoT. So you'll see solutions overseas that, that have Intel or other companies within the United States technology our AI applications, our software that are driving innovation in around the world. And that's expanding our economy just the same because that's created here in the United States. It's built here by us and by our companies that, uh, that are innovating at a faster rate. Well, in my uh, last 24 seconds, let me follow up with that because, uh, again, it's good to hear that the United States is leading on this. What's happening across the globe that uh, is making the United States be that innovator out there? Well, um, <laughs> I think that what we come down to is we have some companies here that are able to look at these solutions, like Intel, truly end-to-end, -end, that goes from the data center all the way to the thing. And so we can look at this problem holistically, and that's important that we do that, as well as some of the new technologies that we'll come up with, with uh, specifically integrated circuits, as well as the software and artificial intelligence and the leadership in artificial intelligence within this country. Well, thank you very much. My time has expired, and I yield back, and I recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, the ranking member of the subcommittee, for five minutes. Thank you. 
Connected devices can follow us through every aspect of our lives, collecting data. At the same time, the committee has spent um, a lot of time looking at um, how the data collected about us is used by companies um, and by the government. We heard from Facebook about how much data it collects, how it shared that data with third parties, and how it used our data to sell advertising. As more and more devices collect data about us, that data can be used to affect our decision making. So Ms. Richardson, let me ask you some questions. Um, while IoT devices provide benefits, are you concerned about their data collection? Absolutely. The way the U.S. works its privacy law is to do it categorically, um, to cover, for example, communications, financial data, health information held by doctors. And if you don't fall into one of these categories, you're just not protected, and there are very few, mm -hmm. if any, limits on how the information can be collected and used. It's going to be possible that a lot of these IoT devices are going to collect data that is not covered by one of these categories already, and that would be one of the benefits of having a baseline comprehensive privacy law in the United States, is we would not have so many cracks, and you would see the IoT data have some procedural rights for Americans. I'd like to work with you on that. Um, five years ago, we were barely talking about location data or facial recognition, and now we're talking about genetic information. Also, Ms. Richardson, should we be concerned about what personal information is out there and how the kinds of personal information available to collect change over time? Yes, um, the, the information that is collected by these devices is really unique. You only have to go back a few years before we widely collected things, like you mentioned, um, that reflect, let's say, your heartbeat, your location, uh, the food you eat, where you go, uh, the people you know, and it can all be aggregated in ways that give a very rich picture about people um, in ways that they might be shocked to know. I think one of the things uh, you saw at your hearing with Facebook is that uh, the surprise factor is really what upsets people in many ways. So. This is something we need to watch more closely, and hopefully a universal privacy law would be able to protect that sort of really sensitive information right now. So it's clear that privacy le legislation is absolutely necessary. I like the way you talk about it in a non-siloed way. In fact, the Federal Trade Commission has recommended many times that Congress enact comprehensive privacy legislation. Ms. Richardson, again, um, the, the Smart IoT Act would examine how different industries are using and developing IoT. Could such a resource be helpful in the development of best practices for privacy and IoT devices? Yes, I think that would um, help us get a better view of where the industry is going. I think you're going to find, though, that there are very few when it comes to privacy. And for the most part, the standards are about interoperability, technical standards, um, and cybersecurity. And you're going to find a really big gap here. Um, so the, the FTC recommended in the past that privacy legislation should not be IOT specific. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Um, we want a forward-looking tech neutral law that will be able to cover all sorts of information regardless of the type of device or entity that's creating it. Um, so um, Mr. Mr. Day said that one of the things that we need to worry about is um, too much regulation standing in, in the way. Um, um, don't you think there's a balance, though, of making sure that we set some rules of the road, some guidelines that industry needs to follow? Yeah, and in a way, those can drive innovation themselves. You end up having uh, requirements that inspire new solutions to protect privacy and security. And um, CDT does believe in a light touch, but there are a few places that government intervention or oversight, is maybe a better word, is most urgent. And that's where you look at things like cars or pacemakers and devices that really have life or death consequences if something goes wrong. And I think we're seeing the consumer market is just an area where everyday people are not able to make informed decisions about the devices they're buying, the information that's collected, and then how to secure the devices. 
Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to sort of continue down that path um, of consumer facing devices and uh, speak a little bit more about uh, being a small business owner or a startup um, and approaching the infrastructure, um, the infrastructure purchase questions from an adequate security measure perspective. Uh, in what direction do we need to head, um, and it may not be necessarily government, it may just be more industry, in what direction do we have to head in order to make sure um, that we are getting it right? Rather open-ended question, but why don't I start with you, Ms. Richardson? As far as uh, security standards go, we have endorsed tech-neutral cybersecurity controls. So these are really top-level decisions that both the manufacturers and the operators can make. So, for example, when you're building a device, you should always have the capacity to update the software, right? And you could say that without giving. Um, a really prescriptive technology you know, description of how to do that, and each company can decide how to do that. And there's a list of maybe a half dozen of these sorts of practices that I think are reasonable to be set as the baseline. And they include other things like being able to have passwords or other authenticators that can be changed and things like that. Uh, following through on that, steps or approaches that small and medium enterprises can utilize to overcome concerns or difficulties relating to the system integration side of IoT solutions. To you, go ahead. Can you repeat the question about uh, system integration? Small and medium enterprises uh, overcoming their concerns or difficulties relating to system yeah. integration of IoT solutions. If, if you look, if you're, I don't want to say a company, if you're a really big company, integrating is very easy if you're a s small. Not actually. <laughs> no. It's actually difficult either way. Um, to honestly, the number one challenge for IoT right now is scale. Scale is very difficult, right? E and even with a company as large as, as you would say Intel, um, there, if you look at our market-ready solutions, rarely do we have a solution that only involves Intel. There's other, there's Dell involved, I mentioned many of our solutions, Bosch was involved. And so you're talking about multiple companies coming together to include a complete solution. And for a small or medium-sized company, that gets even more difficult, right? Um, and this is where the industry standards come into play, because when we start to create standards that are interoperable and that we know work together, that, that a small or medium-sized company can create a piece, and we know that that piece will work with the rest of the system. And, and Intel and many other companies, we were here with Samsung, are working across the industry to help those standards get deployed and become more consistent and interoperable. So when you use the term scale there, what, what are you saying? I, I what I mean by scale there is we're able to create, uh, I'll give you an example, we'll create a proof of concept inside of the walls of Intel in our building, and it will look beautiful and work perfectly. It'll have the end system, the data center, have the store, let's say, it'll do inventory management. As soon as I take that out of my office inside of Intel and try to put it into a Levi store, or I try to put it inside of a, a mall, now it's working with everything else around it, and that's when we struggle because there's other systems, there's old data, there's new data, maybe the infrastructure's there, maybe they have connectivity, maybe they don't, and so that becomes more difficult for us to deploy and then think about thousands and then add millions to that, right? And that's where, where we struggle with being able to take that technology and deploy it into multiple in, um, instances across the world. That's helpful. You were speaking about um, industry standards. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending upon what industry we're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, healthcare, manufacturing, whatever it may be, the place that you go for that industry standard to make its way into code or regulation or, what ha or whatever the case may be is oftentimes different. Uh, share with me um, challenges or frustrations in navigating um, the federal regulatory agencies to determine uh, IoT industry standards and how we could go about improving that. Well, one I would encourage. That's a question for everyone. Yeah. Um, I can start. <laughs> One, I would encourage you to look at the industry standards that are already available um, to us, because the industry is starting to coalesce 
around a, a few standards that go across multiple industries. Again, we're not saying this is just for industrial environment or it's just for retail. This is how we collect data across the board, and that could be a standard. So I would encourage you to look, and I think that's part of the, the recommendations here, is to look what the industry is already doing and leverage that, because we have come across together uh, um, in, in this space. I'll allow you guys some time. Yeah, if, uh, since the gentleman's time has expired, if you all could just uh, real briefly answer that would be great. No, I think what we're doing today and discussing is, a, is the right first step. I think mm -hmm. between the Digit Act and what we're doing with uh, the legislation in draft form today is that first step, and it's the right approach to some of these issues that we're discussing and, and mm -hmm. bringing forward today. Thank you. Would you like to comment? Okay, thank you very much. Yield the, back. The gentleman yields back. His time has expired, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from California for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Lara and Ranking Member Schakowsky, for having this important hearing, and I'd like to thank the witnesses for coming forward and enlightening us as to what's going on out there in the real world. Uh, my background is in uh, engineering. I got my electrical engineering degree from UCSB back in the days when we used punch cards in our programming. If you're technical, you laugh. Uh, so uh, I think a lot has changed, but I think that me, uh, many of us do welcome these changes. And uh, having said that, I think that public policy needs to uh, make sure that we're mindful of this fast-moving um, uh, effort of the Internet of Things and how it affects individuals' privacy, how it affects industries, how it affects jobs, how it affects the jobs of today and tomorrow, and how do we get American workers ready and prepared to be the workers of today and tomorrow. These are the kinds of things that, that weigh on my mind. Uh, during my careers, I, I actually owned a small business at one time, so I know what it's like for a small business to be able to pull something off the shelf in a very efficient, uh, cost-effective manner. And I think the Internet of Things is making that much more efficient every single day and uh, making smaller businesses, especially mom and pops, a heck of a lot more competitive. Where in the old days, maybe back in my days in the 80s and 90s when I was a business owner, everything was in maybe fives and tens of thousands of dollars to, be in a, to get an innovative device. Now it appears that we can actually get an innovative device that changes and allows us to be more efficient and hire more individuals and grow our business to the tune of hundreds of dollars. Is that correct? Do we have devices out there that maybe 20 years ago to innovate were in the thousands of dollars and today it might be only a few hundred? Can, can one of you give me an example of something that you can think of that, that actually uh, touches on that? Absolutely. Um, I, I, it's, um, if you think about for example, the, the building management that was in New York, uh, deployment that we did, those were sensors that were, that were not very expensive. We're talking sensors that are dollars on, uh, as it is, and, th and they can look into a room and, and save a small business on, um, on, on their, their cost, their infrastructure cost, by looking at occupancy inside of a room and deciding that the AC needs to be turned on because no one's in the room. This isn't expensive technology from that standpoint, but it's changing the way we live and the way we operate within our businesses and saving us cost, right? One of the major ways that this, this, uh, this building in New York was able to save money is we found a leak in one of their pipes. Again, we're talking about a sensor that's able to determine that there's a leak in a pipe and we're waste, right? And they were able to, to, to reduce that cost. And so um, from that standpoint, innovation isn't necessarily requiring extensive amount of investment, but there is ways where we can start to make decisions very quick when this data comes together. Ms. Mm -hmm. uh, Richardson, I have a question. Thank you. I have a question for you about uh, consumer applications and how do you think the Internet of Things devices are being used inside manufacturing workplaces. I happen to represent a community in Los Angeles that has a big corridor of manufacturing, lots of tens of thousands of manufacturing jobs in my district. Yeah, and I, I think it's still unknown how this is going to affect the workforce on balance, right? You're gonna create new jobs of the people who actually have to create the devices. And um, we hope that a strong privacy and security practice will create professionals to deal with that also. Um, I think there are questions to ask about whether they will replace human beings on, on the job, but um, there will always be decisions that human beings have to make that we can't let computers do. So I don't think it will eradicate humans altogether. Well, uh, on that note, uh, there, there are things such as smart helmets and smart glasses uh, that now can be deployed in the workplace. And do you have any comments about how these devices might be affecting somebody's privacy in the workplace? 
Yeah, and people's privacy in the workplace is much more limited than in their home or out in public. Uh, Mrs. Long established that employers can really control the type of information that they're collecting on their property and while they're conducting their services. Um, I think though, when you see a lot of these sorts of applications, they don't have to necessarily collect a lot of personal information, right? You, this is where, again, the controls built into the products on the front end are important so that you can collect the information necessary for your work, but not, let's say, what they do on their breaks or uh, the conversations they're having or things that are really not core to doing the job. Th thank you, I mean, Mr. Welsh talked about the cow and I was thinking, wow, I hope that cow's not creeped out about her privacy. <laughs> um, but um, every time she walks into the barn. But um, uh, Ms. Bachani, uh, I know Intel has been active on the connected workers front um, and uh, arguing that they keep workers safe and productive. Can you give us an, an example of that? Absolutely. Um, I actually, there's a, there's a really good example with um, a fireman. Um, which uh, resonates with me, right? By, by connecting a fireman um, that goes inside a building, we now know th by the sensors we can tell what is the oxygen level around him um, or her, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, if the firewoman or fireman is laying down or standing up, what exact location they're in within the building if they were if they're laying down. These are, these are um, opportunities for us to save lives of some of our workers that are working in critical conditions. I think it's essential. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back, and I'm sure they only have happy cows in Vermont. <laughs> the chair now recognizes the general lady from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Day, do you believe that a review of all regulations, guidelines, standards, and other policy efforts undertaken by federal agencies is important, and do you think it will assist us in ensuring consistent policy on Internet of Things related matters? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. Um, yes, I do. I think the Smart I IoT Act, by studying uh, all sectors of the IoT um, and how, uh, they how they regulate technology and current policies will go a long way in cutting down um, overly burdensome regulations and dupl duplicative uh, regulation as well. I think when you're looking at the, the broad spectrum of uh, applications here, it's critical when you're looking at the impact on self-driving cars to getting a patient through a hospital um, more efficiently, cost-effectively, it's all important. And I think the legislation before us today will streamline that process and benefit, quite frankly, everyone. Okay, thank you. And uh, Ms. Vishani, can you please discuss the benefits to a connected world, both for business like Intel as well as consumers who use Internet of thing, Things products? There's multiple benefits. Um, to the Internet of Things, um, whether it be more efficiency inside of a factory. So uh, predictive maintenance is a very simple use case that we use in factories that allow us to determine if a ma machine is going down sooner than, than, than it actually does go down, and that will prevent the downtime for the factory, right? Um, this is a, a fundamental analytics uh, that has changed how, how efficient our factories can be. Let's think of retail, where um, one of the number one uh, determinations of success or, or how they lose customers is because the item you're looking for isn't there. So you go in for a pair of jeans, you don't have your size, you leave, you forget. Um, that's important that we understand um, what people are looking for and that we have the inventory ready for them and that we understand what inventory you have. Inventory loss is a major loss for our retail mm -hmm. businesses, especially brick and mortar businesses. Um, and then um, I would also look at um, cities and how cities are using technologies to do gunshot detection at intersections or um, uh, monitoring the environment as far as um, air quality is concerned. And that data enables us to, to, to decide if the changes we're making, let's say we have uh, in India electric rickshaws, do, are they actually having an impact on our air quality? And to make wise decisions based on data rather than a hypothesis of that we're making things better. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Day, as we continue to advance toward an increasingly connected world, some have expressed concerns with protecting consumer information. These are vitally important concerns, yet we also must acknowledge that inter Internet of Things devices and a connected world provide substantial societal benefits. Can you speak to how we can protect consumer information without losing the upside to a more connected world? Um. You know, I think it's, it's obvious the Chamber believes that consumers deserve to have their, their personal uh, data and 
respected by the companies, and it's important that we are mindful of that um, going forward. I think the other thing that I mentioned in my uh, opening statement was that technology is not a single, all-powerful industry, and that I think it's important that this is a part of, a, of every industry. And when we're looking at the Internet of Things, I think it, it's something that we, we need to be mindful of, but not um, directly linking the privacy cons you know, issue to this legislation as we go forward. But I think it is something, as, as we've all testified to, that it's, it's important and we need to be um, considering what data means now because data is being created in massive amounts and how that is handled is, is truly important. And I think that's one of the areas where the Chamber um, is, is doing a lot of work and you'll be hearing more from us on some of the, the importance um, of privacy principles going forward as a result of some of the discussions that we've been hearing in Washington lately. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Vashani, as you may know, this committee is very focused on the advancement of self-driving cars. Your testimony discusses the enormous benefit of increased mobility that autonomous vehicles will provide for aging and disabled populations. Can you expand on this and discuss the role inter Internet of Things plays? Um, autonomous vehicles, what I, what, uh, the connection back to an aging population is if you don't have public transportation, for, for someone to get to the hospital or someone to get to where they want to go for a social benefit, let's say, and having more more independence for our elderly population. A vehicle that is autonomous is safer for them to get from point A to point B, and that enables them the flexibility and the independence that we want for our elderly population. Okay, thank you, and um, I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentlelady yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and to Ranking Member Schakowsky for the leadership on this issue and to everybody for being here. I think that it's safe to say that we do have agreement on both sides of the aisle about the significant and revolutionary things that the Internet of Things is bringing to industry and consumers, and you all have certainly talked today about examples where it's already making a difference. But I continue to have a reservation that's been expressed uh, by a number of other my colleagues uh, in as we compare the rise of IoT to the development of the Internet, that um, the uh, Internet thrived because of the light regulatory touch used and I think we're not paying enough attention to security and privacy. So I have to already say to you, Mr. Day, before I even ask you my questions, to say that we shouldn't deal with privacy is not something that I'm going to be comfortable with because I think that the technology, um, that the Facebook hearings have showed, people had no idea the amount of data that was being tracked on them already. There aren't there isn't security and how that information is being used and we're not protecting even the privacy of an individual. So I won't go off on that right now, but I had to respond to that comment. But I would like to ask a, um, a few questions. Ms. Richardson, in a market that's rapidly evolving, how have you seen companies balancing getting to the market first with protecting security? Yeah, um, we often see that privacy and security is what falls short here. And um, a lot of these controls that are considered to be best practices are not hard from a technical matter. For example, um, a couple of years ago, the BITTAG, um, the Broadband Internet Technical Advisory Group, put out a report with a list of maybe five to 10 things that were of utmost priority, like encryption, right? Making sure that the data collected was protected in transit, in storage, um, avoiding hard-coded passwords. This is one of the problems with the Mirai botnet, right? All of those cameras were accessible with the same password that hackers knew, and they were able to get all these cameras. And um, if you meet some of these baseline best practices, you're going to lift all boats, right? It's not gonna solve every problem, but it will certainly give us herd immunity as users of all of these different devices. Thank you. Ms. Vicani, on the consumer side, have you seen privacy being designed into these products before they're hitting the market? Yes, actually, I, I will tell you um, and hope to give you confidence that the security and privacy is utmost imperative um, when we're designing a solution. Where we store data, how that data is transmitted, um, and, and, we, and we look at that as, as a fundamental premise 
as we're integrating these solutions. And, and we make decisions that are different. We may store data locally because it makes it easier for us to be able to protect it. And so these, these, these criteria are absolutely imperative in, in the solutions that we create. And, and we, um, if you look at uh, the solution that we had with regards to the healthcare monitoring, that's FDA um, approved, and we follow all HIPAA laws, right? We enable our silicon so that our consumers are able, our solution developers are able to follow HIPAA laws. So not to be sarcastic, but as someone who's been hacked at least 15 times <laughs> by every one of the major ones, you'll for, and that's one of the difficulties, is once that hack occurs, once that data is obtained by somebody, you can't put the genie back into the bottle. Mr. Day, I know your organization has, is concerned and apprehensive about regulations as you expressed it, but one of my concerns is going to build right on what I just said, that down the road there will be these massive data breaches that we keep seeing or an abuse of privacy. We'll convene a hearing, the witnesses will be questioned, everybody will express outrage and concern but the damage will have already been done, which was done in the Facebook, which I just talked about. Do you think it would be helpful to develop some clear rules of the road for companies now so we can try to mitigate this for the future? Thank you, Congresswoman, uh, for the question. And to answer you directly, yes, I firmly believe that. And I think I would like to suggest that uh, the offer is extended to work with you and your office on these issues. In fact, the Chamber is, in, is currently going through a process right now on developing privacy uh, principles that we will um, be working with Congress on. And so I think probably earlier than later to be engaging with you and your, your staff would be a great uh, opportunity. I will tell you again that I, we firmly believe consumers uh, deserve the, you know, to have their personal data respected by companies that they're working with. And I think that, that it's critical though that we strike that proper regulatory balance um, that uh, protects consumers while promoting the technology that we all use every day and appreciate. And that's one of the biggest challenges we have in this committee. I know I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman, but it would be interesting for the record to get what principles they are coalescing around that you mentioned earlier Absolutely. in your testimony. I think it would be useful for all of us. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky for five minutes. Thank you very much. It's uh, Great to be here. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for having all the witnesses here. Uh, we've had some really interesting hearings in this space. The other day we did quantum computing, which I'm still trying to <laughs> figure out. The guy said, well, I'll make it simple for you. It's like flipping a coin and getting heads and tails is normal. In quantum world, you can flip a coin and get heads and tails at the same time. So that really made it simple for me. I've been thinking about that all weekend, trying to, <laughs> to, trying to uh, figure out what he actually meant. But that's how he explained it. But it is good that we're uh, getting to like a product, you know, a work product out of this. So it's important. So that's kind of what I want to focus on today, and hopefully things I can understand. So, Mr. Day, can you briefly explain why voluntary industry-led, globally recognized, and consensus-based processes for Internet of Things standards are so critical? And could you name some examples of industry-led efforts that are currently taking place? So I think with this legislation, as as I testified to, I think is an important first step, and I think by having um, certain uh, uh, standards set and compiling information again by all industries and sectors will benefit um, all of us. And that I think the, the benefits both to consumers, to industrial and to government are very clear. And you know, it's everything from keeping a global um, competitive lead on other countries and that this country needs to continue to be the leader in technology. And again, I think you know, it's, it's, it's a great, uh, uh, attribution to what the, the subcommittee and full committee has done on a bipartisan basis on self-driving cars to, you know, the healthcare applications that we've discussed. So there's a whole host and, and wide variety of, of areas where this is a true benefit. And again, uh, fully support the um, legislation, the draft legislation, and uh, the, the Digit Act as well. We have uh, come out in, in support of that early on and, and work, hope to work with the committee going forward on, on passing the legislation. Thanks. And so, Ms. Richardson, Ms. Richardson uh, why do you believe compiling a list of industry standard setting efforts under the SMART IoT Act will be a critical part of helping to inform future congressional action? Yes, and we would go one step further to say the list should also come with an estimation of whether the standards are being implemented. We don't want you to come back or get a report back that has a thousand standards listed because the next question is going to be, 
well, are these being implemented, right? Who's using these and are they working? That's the logical question and I think that's what um, Congress, advocates, industry is sort of dancing around at this moment is, is that process working. So I would recommend to include that analysis too and that would help you figure out where you really wanna focus your efforts going forward. Okay, thank you. And, and Ms. Bachani, we've heard in the past hearings about the critical need for security and good cyber hygiene, both in production lines for IoT devices within the, and within the federal government. What are you doing at Intel to safeguard IoT devices and networks from hacking vulnerabilities, and what can small to mid-sized businesses do to take meaningful steps to address data security concerns? So if I look at uh, Intel's contribution here, we are fun our security is fundamentally written into the silicon development. So it's in hardware, it's software, it's in the connectivity. So we think of silicon across the board and we think of security across the board. We are also one of the areas that you talked about with software defined, right? Can, as security standards start to change, or as we learn more, can we reprogram our devices? Can we update those? And so that's included in our, in our assumptions. So we enable the industry through not only hardware, but software security to be able to implement the best known security that we know at this point in, 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 uh, in our space. So um, absolutely paramount in what we do. Okay, thank you. I, I know you, you mentioned earlier, and I, I had another hearing, so, but I, I heard you mentioned earlier scale, but could you name what you see as other potential impediments to deployment of IoT and what we should be aware of going forward? Well, one of the, th uh, we, we've talked quite a bit about standards, and, and one thing I, I wanna make sure we make uh, the point of is these standards are international. And so scale is just not within the United States. I'd like for us to be competitive internationally. And having these standards that were global allows us to provide technology to other countries and export our, 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 uh, our great uh, uh, exp experience that we have here. And so I, I believe the interoperability and um, enabling us to be competitive internationally and taking advantage of these international standards will be, will be important for us to be successful. Thank you, and thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. It's a little more understandable for someone like me. <laughs> I, I asked the guy, how could you flip a coin and get both? I he have says, no it's, idea. Like, it's like putting it in a box, and the box is continually spinning, and that really clears up. <laughs> this, is the, this has come from guys never solved the golf peg game at Cracker Barrel, so uh, we'll figure it out. Thanks a lot. Thanks. I appreciate it. And I'll go back. <laughs> the gentleman yields back, and the chair recognizes the gentlelady from California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and the ranking member for having this hearing today, and I want the witnesses, um, thank you very much for being here. Um, I've discussed the potential blockchain applications at the subcommittee before, including its possibility to allow spectrum sharing as next generation broadband networks are deployed. As you all know, blockchain is a decentralized accounting technology that verifies transactions through a shared ledger system. When a transaction in a blockchain is completed, that transaction is verified against a ledger stored on each computer in the network. The IoT and connected devices will facilitate a significant expansion of data transactions, likely between multiple different networks. And blockchain could be used to verify and secure these transactions. Is there an opportunity for this legislation to more precisely explore how new technologies could facilitate the secure advancement of internet connected devices? and anyone on the panel can answer that. Uh, I'll, I'll take a first uh, attempt at answering that question, and I, I agree with you. I think blockchain is certainly an area where um, IoT um, will offer a lot of benefit. At the chamber, we are just uh, now beginning to work on our FinTech work, and we're calling on members to, to help us understand the benefits, and so I think there are uh, a number of ways that we should be looking at this. I think the legislation as drafted, though, is the, is the correct step. Um, it allows for technologies like blockchain and, and others to progress. But as we are understanding the technology and the benefits thereof, we can continue to work with you and other members of, the, of Congress on implementing certain um, uh, regulations as it's appropriate um, mm -hmm. facing the, the technology. Anyone else? Blockchain is. Um Absolutely, a technology that Intel is looking at and one that can be used in IoT applications, mm -hmm. so um, really good connection there. Um, I, I think, though, one of the, the points that you made when we kicked off is you're looking five to ten years out and you have the benefit of doing so. 
and so today it's blockchain, and tomorrow it, it is an, uh, it could be something even more um, revolutionary, and that's why it's important that we consider this not from a very technology specific standpoint, but your bore holistically as to what's necessary for us to be successful, regardless of the implementation technology. Okay. Um, Narrowband IoT networks are particularly useful for long-range, low-power applications. Mm -hmm. Specifically, these networks improve capacity, spectrum efficiency, and power consumption levels of user devices. Narrowband IoT networks have potential both nationwide and particularly for rural and indoor coverage. These networks can coexist with commercial mobile networks, and their propagation characteristics could provide better range and reduce coverage costs for consumers in both rural areas and across the country. Um, anyone on the panel, what role do narrowband networks have in the IoT ecosystem from a spectrum efficiency, cost, and deployment perspective? I think narrowband is going to help with, um, there, there's several el elements of narrowband that makes uh, IoT applications that you've already referred to. It's lower cost, mm -hmm. lower power, and a longer, which enables longer um, battery life. So think about, um, we currently have an application where we're sensing the environment for a case of strawberries, right? We want to make sure the humidity is right. <laughs> we want to make sure the temperature is right. Narrowband allows for that connectivity, the continuous connectivity, while extending the battery life and not increasing the cost of something that 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 we'd want to do with, with a pack of strawberries. Um, also understand that when we move to the world of 5G, now all of this comes together. So now we have a narrowband spectrum. 5G includes all of those spectrums, will enable us to be able to pull this together as a complete solution. It revolutionizes how we think of connectivity and our spectrums because narrowband's included, as well as low latency, as well as high bandwidth. Okay, great. Could anyone else want to comment on that? Okay. Um, spectrum is the invisible infrastructure and um, Congressman Guthrie and I are working on this. In the, it underpins our communications infrastructure. An adequate supply is necessary to realize the potential of next generation broadband networks and the IoT. Specifically, agencies should have access to funds made available for engineering research that could lead to the repurposing of spectrum for commercial use. What role would next generation networks play in our IoT strategy, and how would delivering more spectrum to commercial users help? I, um, I would uh, summarize it into, um, into one word, which is interoperability. If mm -hmm. you think about a wider spectrum analysis, so 5G enables low spectrum as well as high, uh, high, low latency, high bandwidth, and now you have that on one network. And so you're able to include all of those. Remember I said that, it, that it's not very much a vertical solution. We have all kinds of pieces that are coming together into an IoT solution, which can vary in spectrum. And once we have a solution that encompasses all those spectrums, now it makes deployments easier for our customers, thus enabling scale, which we Okay, I run out of time, so thank you very much. Thank you. you back. Thank you very much. The gentlelady's time has expired, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from West Virginia for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and I apologize to the panel that we've got a hearing going on downstairs, so we're back and forth in between, and I'm, perhaps I've missed some of your testimony that, that, that targeted what my questions were, but uh, I want to begin with saying uh, I'm, I'm going to start by assuming you've all read uh, Casey's book, The Third Wave, two, two out of three of it. Uh, I'm kind of, I was fascinated with that book, um, uh, the, the possibilities of where we might go um, long term. Um, things of, like it, it was mentioned about refrigerator that it could speak to you, your clothing could tell you how you're, how you, whether your wellness. Those are all interesting long terms. I'm, I'm somewhat interested in the short term, though, however. Um, and, and that is, um, is, is there, Anyone, can you tell me from the earth, the three experiences we have up here, um, is there something in the pipeline for the IoT that might, might indicate the propensity of an area to have a problem with opioid uh, abuse? Um, I know some people, have or they've, they've talked about doing it to be able to develop where that might be but is there anyone that you know of that's actually got something close to fruition that we could do this? Because we're getting, 
is we all know nationally getting hit pretty hard with this and we don't know where the next problem is going to crop up until after we're reacting rather than being proactive. So I'm curious to see with the Internet of Things in the short term, is there someone developing software that might be able to identify where the next problem could crop up? Yes, actually, Intel's working on a, um, um, a exactly on on that problem, um, considering the monitoring of medicine and the ability to know exactly where that medicine is going and is it going to the right person, um, monitoring how many tablets are there and, and knowing exactly who's taking those, um, having some facial detection, who's picking up those 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 tablets. And so, um, absolutely, I believe that there is a connection. You've made a very relevant connection, and thank you for that. What's um, the time scale? Do you have a sense of We're where seeing an implementation um, immediately, um, it, it, and it's an evolution over time. Sure. Remember, we're not going to have facial detection immediately at all of our pharmacies, but it'd be interesting. Um, it's an evolution over time, but we're seeing implementations uh, r right away in which we can start to monitor medicine better. Um, it is just, it's just a matter of is it getting to the right person, how many, and are the right people taking it? So you well, think about the opiate, but you can also think about it at th with elderly patients as well, right? Or making sure they're taking uh, their medicines on time. That may be working, but again, the propensity. What, that this area, this community may be neck hit hard next. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm looking for as well. Where uh, the, the, the fact that there could be some software that says with the drugs, 20 million mm -hmm. uh, pills are going to one pharmacy, that ought to trigger right. something. Uh, but in the meantime, is there socioeconomic barriers that we need to break down? So, Mr. Day, you look like you had you were going to contribute to this conversation. So, yes, at the chamber, uh, Congressman, we have been looking at economic um, situations across the country and that impact of joblessness and how um, communities have been impacted by this, this plight and looking at ways that we can start to examine the linkage between the two. And I think to the, the point on monitoring uh, pill bottles and knowing times of when they're taken and, and monitoring, uh, you know, who are getting their prescriptions, et cetera. Those are things that are happening now, but there is a lot more to be done. Well, and if I, I could on that, let's just, because you touched on something I want to be I'm kind of sensitive to is the socioeconomic, the economic, uh, uh, household income, education level, like West Virginia uh, has some will use that as excuse or why West Virginia is being the leading the nation in opioid but number two until last year was New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And New Hampshire has a op polar opposites on that. It has one of the highest household income, it has the highest education level, and, and, and on and on and on with good socioeconomics. So I think there's, a, there's something separating the two between those. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious if someone's developing something more sophisticated than just going on socioeconomics. I'm not personally aware, to be honest with you, but I think it would be an opportunity for us to work together as we continue our work at the chamber and working with our member companies on various technologies, and I'd be happy to, to, to do that. I'd like to pursue that. I'd like to offer that we can follow up with the, the details of the solution I just If you could, um, back to my presented. office, I'd appreciate that. I'd love that. to do that. All of you. Thank you very that much. I yield back my time. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Vermont, and I want to thank him for all of his hard work, uh, not only in this Congress, but in the last Congress, uh, working on IoT issues with me. So thank you very much. The gentleman's recognized for uh, five well, minutes. Thank you, and um, thank you as well, Mr. Latta. Um, I, I want to focus a little bit on rural America, just to have each of you say what it is we need to do in rural America if we're going to have any opportunity to yield the benefits of IoT. I'll start with you, Mr. Day. So I think one of the most important things, and you mentioned it earlier, Congressman, is the fact that broadband is not um, in every household in the country. And, and that's, that's first and foremost, I think, for a lot of reasons. I think for being able to compete globally, um, being able to be connected and be able to have a business based upon the Internet is critical. Yeah. And so I think for rural America, and I applaud your, your efforts, um, that's first Thanks. and foremost. Thanks. Ms. Richardson? Well, I think the whole point of having standards and what your bill is discussing is to shift the responsibility for security to the people who can best address it, right? The manufacturers, the operators. And I think this is where um, sort of low tech users benefit most from this. And so to the extent that your rural users um, are rapidly um, deploying new, new technology that they're not familiar with, they will certainly benefit from better security standards. Thanks, Ms. Vishani. Absolutely. I think 
I absolutely applaud the benefit to, to get broadband into rural America, but understand that we can do technology, implement technology today, whether it be a cellular signal, right? Um, I'll, I'll give you the example of my parents who still live in the same house that I grew up in and won't leave no matter what I do. Um, at this point, I, having some level of monitoring, making sure they're getting up in the morning and, and that they're mm -hmm. op somebody's opened the refrigerator that she's eating, right? There's elements of that that I think it's important that we can do today for rural America with the connectivity that we have and we don't have to, to limit ourselves to that deployment. Okay, thank you. The other broad question I just want to go down the panel is about privacy and security. You've talked a little bit about that. Uh, but is there a role that you believe that Congress has to play in ensuring an individual's personal data is protected? Uh, and is it your view that an individual has to have the control over how his or her data is being used? Something we asked Mr. Zuckerberg when he was here a while ago. Well, again, I think um, to emphasize the point that consumers, again, have um, and deserve the right to have their personal data um, respected Let's by go all. quickly because I have one more question. But so as we develop our principles at the chamber, I look forward to working with you on those details. Thank you. We eventually need legislation. That's going to be the only way out of this okay. mess we're in. I think working together with the between government and industry is, is essential to, to come up with those solutions. But there, there has to be some role that Congress plays. We can't be passive observers of what's going on, right? You agree with that? Thanks. Uh, let me ask you, Ms. Vishani, I know Intel's been um, a leader in IoT advancement, uh, and I know you've had a high position as a thought leader uh, in that space for years. So I want to follow up your, on your testimony and ask if you can expand uh, your suggestions as to the definition uh, that we should use in this bill and why it's so important to get that definition right. One of the, the number one challenges of scale, and it sounds very simple, is terminology. We talk past each other when, we, when we're having, and, and I see us doing it in the industry. And so we're in this space, we live it and breathe it, but we use different words to represent different things and we're, we're talking past each other. So one of the, the fundamental things I've had to do within my organization, within my company, as well as outside, is to start to get on the same language. And that's one of the things we're asking for, the, uh, for, for this as well, is just to get on the same language so we know when we're speaking to the, each other what we, we're, we're referring to. Okay, thank you. Uh, I thank the panel, very helpful, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Mullen, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank our panel for being here. Um, I, I got a, just a few questions, and uh, Ms. Fashani, is that how you pronounce it? Uh, I, I appreciate you being here, and I just, for the, for the help, of myself, and you might have already been asked this question, but as you've heard, we're running back and forth between no committees. Uh, are there barriers, or what are the barriers that's keeping the U.S. from leading in the IoT? You know, um, it's, I'll ask, I answer this question of scale, but I'll answer this question slightly differently um, to add to that. Um, what I find is, if you look at the city level, there's quite a bit of innovation going on. I talked about San Diego and what San Diego is doing within their lights in California. Um, we talked about New York and the building that's happening in building management that's happening in New York. At the city level, I believe that that, um, that implementation is taken seriously and there's a lot of innovation happening. But where, where I think we can make a difference is scale across the city at a nationwide, right? So these pockets of innovation, how we can we reuse, how can we learn, and how can we deploy it more worldwide, I mean, more United States-wide? That's slightly different than what I see in other countries where we're looking at it more nationally. India, China are looking at it more nationally, and so you get the benefit of the individual innov innovations that are happening at a national level. Well, I'll use my district, for example, even my personal house. We don't, we don't even have slow dial-up. The best we can do is 3G through our mm -hmm. phone. And 50% of my district has little to no access to the Internet. Mm -hmm. And so we're talking about metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. But you're right. We're leaving out the rural, park it, the rural pockets, which is, by mileage-wise, is the vast majority Maybe. of our country. Uh, is is that is other countries as you alluded to are they doing a better job at that and then and if so what are they doing that we're not? Um, so 
large parts of India and large parts of China don't have connectivity either, right? A and so um, that isn't uh, an isolated uh, and probably more of an issue there than it is even, even here. Um, they are looking at how to deploy faster so that these rural areas do have connectivity. So that's one area we could um, look further at as well as leveraging the technology that is available. So um, going into a factory in, in, in another country, they have no connectivity, no, no uh, broadband, but they have some level of 3G. We're able to leverage that to at least start to get some automation within the factory. So again, taking advantage of the connectivity that we do have and maximizing that, at the same time deploying more, uh, more robust connectivity. So how, what role can Congress play then? How can we, how can we, how, how can we encourage companies uh, or industry to look out farther than just the metropolitan areas? Uh, is We did this with electricity. We did this with phone service. Mm -hmm. um, this is a new technology that's keeping us from connecting. So what is it that we can do? What can Congress do to put in place to help encourage that? I think we can look at this um, not in the silos that we do today. You have the benefit of a holistic view, not just in each department, but as, as a holistic view how right. we deploy this. Um, that's the benefit. And then, frankly speaking, how, how do we invest so that we start to start to um, deploy this technology uh, more robustly? Can, is there an investment uh, strategy to that as well? Well, thank you so much. Switching gears, uh, Ms. Richardson, how different, how difficult is it to secure an IoT device? Um, I, I think that would depend on the device itself um, and how it's connected to the internet. I think there are a handful of best practices that we see across um, different sectors and industries, things like encryption, strong password and other authentication models, updatability. Is there, is there certain security measures that have been put in place uh, since the 2014 target breach, especially the one to cry uh, ransom? Um, there's nothing mandatory, um, and I think the these sorts of practices Should that there I've, be? That, that's a hard question, and I'm realistic about mandatory requirements on um, the private sector, I don't think we're there. I think though the government should explore its own purchasing power right now. Um, you know, the Trump administration and some of the agencies are writing privacy and security guidelines in preparation for a big level up in purchase of um, IT modernization. And that would be one way that you could influence the market without forcing anybody to do anything specific. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Clark, is recognized for five minutes. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank our ranking member, Ms. Tchaikovsky. I'd like to also thank our panels uh, for their expert with their expert testimony here uh, this morning. Uh, as you may be aware, earlier this year I launched the Congressional Smart Cities Caucus, and I'd add Smart Communities with Rep. Daryl Issa. I was inspired to start the Smart Cities Caucus from my personal interactions with seeing the amazing build out firsthand in New York City. The Smart Cities Caucus serves as a bipartisan group of members dedicated to bringing American communities into the 21st century through innovation and technological change. Embracing smart technology will make our communities more sustainable, resilient, efficient, livable, and competitive in a world in which technology is constantly e advancing. So I'd like to ask a couple of questions. First to you, Ms. Richardson. What are your recommendations for the Smart IoT Act, considering the interplay of the smart cities uh, and uh, which federal agencies should play an active role in sort of harnessing uh, what we know already? Um, well, you have some of the workhorses of the cybersecurity world in commerce, right? So that is a benefit that you have with NIST, NTIA, and other places. Um, I think when you look at the smart cities, you have a couple of different types of devices. You have really basic ones that don't collect personal information. Um, you know, they're, they're low broadband um, information sharers, right? And they're just water pressure, how many cars pass through here, things like that, um, that are going to be less risky from both a security and privacy standard. I, I hope that your report will um, highlight some of the more um, high risk things that are either facial recognition, location tracking, right? That's um, the result of many of these things like license plate readers or toll roads and how those are being um, deployed by the government. Um, Ms. Vashani, uh, 
Intel IoT portfolio includes smart cities, smart buildings, and smart video. What are your recommendations and why are smart cities so important to Intel's IoT portfolio? Um, essentially, the smart cities enables us to create a, um, an infrastructure for safer cities, as well as um, enabling our, our cities to do better planning. Um, if you look at the GE solution that we deployed on smart cities, it, it does stuff like gunshot detection, right? It's determining if there was a shot, and, and if so, what we do about it. It looks at um, air quality, right? And, and so this enables us to take advantage of the technology we've built for many other industries. Smart City is a culmination of many other technologies we've built, maybe for a factory or for a home, but we're able to leverage that to improve not only um, our, our environment as well as our cities and its, its, its planning. Um, so we see that there's a leverage of, of our technology across the board and that smart cities can take advantage of it. And would you um, just sort of envision for some of my colleagues who are in rural communities um, how we can uh, sort of look at that ecosystem that is being uh, developed in sort of more densely populated areas and uh, what uh, can be taken from that uh, for sort of more sprawling communities in terms of connecting them in smart ways? Yes, and if you look at the, uh, I'll go back to the GE solution. The GE solution takes advantage of a light pole. So that's what we're, we're, we're building on top of. It already has electricity. It already has power. We take advantage of that power to connect up sensors, and then it uses a, connect, a, a 3G connection that goes back up into um, a data center. So again, we're able to take advantage of infrastructure that's already there um, and built in um, as best as possible. Very well. And Mr. Day, anything that you'd like to add in this? Absolutely. Case? And I want to applaud you on your efforts with uh, Congressman Issa with um, co-chairing that, that caucus. It's very important. And CTEC has uh, joined you at a couple of events, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. But I think when you look at, at a city, for example, 20 percent of a given city in the United States is dedicated um, during a workday to parking. And I think one of the things that, uh, that CTEC has been taken as a priority and working with you and others on is the fact that autonomous vehicles um, will impact both that issue as well as the environment and other issues. And, and I think it, it, in the end, will will prove to be very uh, beneficial for a lot of reasons. And so smart city um, activities are, are critical in, in, in what we're trying to do and be creative in our thinking and approach and how IoT plays into that um, is, uh, is paramount and the top priority of, of ours going forward. Very well. Thank you very much for your response today, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlewoman yields back. Seeing there are no further members wishing to ask questions, I would like to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. Before we conclude, I would like to include the following documents to be submitted for the record by unanimous consent. A letter from the Consumer Technology Association, a letter from CTIA, and a letter from EPIC. Pursuant to committee rules, I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record, and I ask that witnesses submit their response within 10 business days upon receipt of the questions. Without objection, the subcommittee is adjourned. Have a good day. Hey, well done. Thank you. Yep.